All right, hi, welcome everybody to the uh, October Pressbooks product update. I'm Steel Wagstaff, the Pressbooks product manager, and I want to start by showing you some of the things that we've released in recently in the last month or two that you may have missed, some new features that might be useful for you. The first thing I want to do is share my screen here and show you a Pressbooks uh, webbook. And um, there's a couple of new features that we've added that help you display typefaces uh, for different types of situations. One of the more common ones that we heard about were people that were working with music projects. And so when you're use, working with musical notation, there's a bunch of special characters in the Unicode typeset that represent musical characters. So here's some examples of musical characters in HTML. Um, they render usually pretty okay in HTML, but in the export formats, you have to have those characters included for the typefaces. So what we did here, if you wanna work with musical uh, notation, when you come into appearance and theme options, you see a bunch of different languages and scripts that you can declare support for. And when you declare support for these languages, what it does is it Pressbooks makes sure that you have all of the characters needed for all of your export formats, that the typefaces are included in the export. And one of the new things that we've added here is musical notation. So if you were to look previously, before I turn this on, and I made an, if I were to make an export of this book, I'll just make a quick PDF export. You'll notice in that chapter, all of those musical characters will just be like question marks, the character will be missing. And that's not obviously ideal. So post turning this on, you'll see that the characters are replaced with the values that you expect. So um, to turn that on for a book that you're working on that uses music, you just come to the languages and script support and add musical notation. Many of you have worked with this for other languages or scripts that you've been working in. Um, we've talked about some of the other ones in the past and musical notation is a new choice. So here's the before kind of, if I were to open a PDF and we come into my musical notation, you'll see, oh, these characters are all missing or not all of them, but some of them are missing. Some of the more common ones will be there, but others will be missing. Now, once I turn musical notation, I say, I want this included for the book. What we do is we add, there's a nice um, open typeface for musical notation called Bravura text. And we've just now gone and downloaded the Bravura text font files so that we can include it and package it with all of our exports. So here, if I were to redo this export another time, um, then it will give us the musical notation and include it with the file. A couple other changes that we made are, if you're looking at your themes, there's a bunch of different Pressbooks themes, but when we built Malala, which was a common textbook theme, we added a feature called Shapeshifter. And Shapeshifter lets you choose different typeface pairings for your webbook, ebook, and PDF exports. People liked it in Malala and they wanted it in McLuhan, which is our other kind of main basic theme. And so now if you come into McLuhan and you look at the web options, you'll see the ability to choose a specific header font and a specific body font for the webbook, PDF, and ebook all separately. So, and we've added a couple of new choices by request. So, one of them, for example, I'll show you Sorts Mill Goody is a new header or a new typeface that's available. And the body font, we've added new Athena Unicode. This one's specifically um, designed for working with Greek and other ancient languages. So, this, I have a book that has an example of some Greek text. And so, I'm turning these two typefaces on for the webbook, and I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. So um, if I were to load this book now, um, let me actually show you the new PDF. I'm doing two things at once. So here's the example of the musical notation. Now that I've added the musical notation, all of these characters are, I can make it a little bit bigger if you want. You'll see that all of the characters here are now the expected characters um, and they aren't the question marks anymore. The other thing that we can do here is I've changed the header and typeface choices. So when I visit this book here, um, this is using that Sorts Mill Goody and the body text is using the Greek one. So if I were to go to that chapter that I had earlier, you'll see this is rendering in that new Athena Unicode typeface and here's Sorts Mill Goody. I could have this be the same files or different files uh, or different typefaces in the exports. Just as I went to web options and selected them, I could also go to PDF options and choose Sorts Mill Goody and New Athena Unicode. Or I could have separate typefaces for the web and different ones for the PDF, et cetera. So that's a feature called Shapeshifter and it's now available in McLuhan and we've added a couple of new options. 
Um, any questions about how to use Shapeshifter or any of the type options there or about musical notation before I move on? Okay, great. Um, the next thing that we did was, um, one thing that we noticed is often when people are filling out their book info, there's a place in the book info, where am I at? Uh, that you can enter an ISBN number. This is the international standard book number. Um, and the ISBN is something that you would use for online ebook stores. Like if you wanted to sell your book, it needs to have an ISBN. There's also a print ISBN. So if you're making a print copy of your book, you need to have a separate ISBN. And there's a space to enter a DOI or a digital object identifier. And that's just like a permanent resource identifier that a digital resource can be issued so that you can permanently identify it, even if it's URL changes or something like that. So we've supported the ability to enter this in the book info, but these are actually expected or required to be unique per book. And so when we were cloning books, we were previously including all of the metadata as and the ISBN and DOIs, which would produce problems if you had duplicates. You're not supposed to have a duplicate for these values. So what we've done is we've made a change so that now when you clone a book, we will not include the ISBNs or DOIs when a book is cloned. So we just wanted people to be aware of that. That should make things better for most cases. But if you have already entered the DOI for a book and have made a copy and want the copy to be the official one, you'll need to remove it from the old one and put it in the new one. So just something to be aware of. Um, I can take questions about ISBN and DOI. I also see in the chat, there was a question about font considerations. Um, Jonathan asked, do these font considerations impact fonts in mathematics? Could you say a bit more about what you mean, Jonathan? Well, like there's often uh, Greek uh, letters in mathematical formulae and uh, yes. also Roman Latin letters. Do, do those fonts change with, um, with these? Okay. With these font changes. So it depends. Uh, it depends on how you've entered the mathematics. So most of the time, people are going to be rendering mathematics in Pressbooks using uh, LaTeX or a different form of mathematical notation. In those cases, these font changes will not affect it. LaTeX, if you're using the built-in Pressbooks um, MathJax tool, here's where you select your math typefaces. So these are the fonts that are available for the MathJax and the LaTeX math. Um, if you're using the WP Quick LaTeX plugin, they have a single typeface that's already selected. And anytime it says math expression, it will just use that typeface and that tool to make the image. If, however, you were writing a math expression by just entering the Greek characters, uh, like if you wanted like delta uh, degree mark and you just use the Unicode, then yes, those would be affected by your typeface choice. But most of the time when people are using math, they're using one of these input formats. And then it, this will be what controls those particular characters, what typeface is used there. Hopefully that answers the question. I can take a follow up if that wasn't very clear. Okay, great. Um, other questions that people have about either typefaces or ISBN DOI stuff? Terrific, okay. The next thing I want to show then is uh, what happens with glossary terms. It's a pretty minor change, but when you create a glossary term in Pressbooks, you'll notice that in the web book, it receives a dashed underline link. We've also um, changed the default behavior so that glossary terms are now bolded, just emphasized with by default. And the other thing that we've done is we've made it so that glossary terms will be bolded in the export formats as well. So many people wanted to say, well, how do I see that there's a glossary term in my PDF export? Previously, there wasn't a visual indicator. Now they'll be bolded by default. And we've, we've given you a class called uh, dot glossary term, glossary dash term, I'll put it in the chat. This is a class that you can target if you'd like to change the appearance of the glossary term in your export formats. So what that means is um, if I were to produce an export, Obviously, it wouldn't be a link in my PDF, but it would be a bolded term. And if I wanted it to have some other kind of styling, I could come into my custom styles and I could say in the PDF, glossary term, and then I could write whatever styling, like I could say text decoration 
underlined. If I wanted them all to be underlined, this would then, every time a glossary term appeared, I would apply this styling for my PDF exports. So that's a new kind of feature we've added where glossary terms will be bolded by default in your exports. And they also have a single class that you can use to target them for whatever additional styling or even to remove the bolding if you don't like it. No, so that's, those are some options that people have. Any questions about glossary terms or what that looks like? I guess I can show you an export um, and you can see, where did I make my export earlier? Um, you can see here's the glossary term, it's now bolded in the export. Um, another thing that we've changed is we've improved the way that we handle um, embeds. This is a, oh, sorry, I'm trying to do two things at once. Let me stop for a second and do one thing at once. Um, okay, I'm going to share my screen again. There is a, okay, can you see my screen again? Yes, okay. So uh, it, there is a streaming video service that many universities use that's called Kaltura. And Kaltura is kind of like a campus branded YouTube or a streaming media service. Kaltura supports a format or a specification called OEmbed, which lets you just take a URL and the, the publisher will be able to see, oh, this is an OEmbed URL and it will automatically replace it with an iframe embed. YouTube already does this, Vimeo already does this, a lot of the streaming media services. Kaltura supports it and we've added better support for those institutions that we know are using Kaltura. So for example, University of Wisconsin has a Kaltura instance and they want to use OEmbed. Now on any Pressbooks network, if I take this OEmbed link and I come in and edit my, uh, edit my chapter here. Uh, okay, hold on, edit this chapter. And if I want, I can just paste this URL on its own line. Oops, I'm doing it wrong. Help. <laughs> paste the URL on its own line and my demo didn't work. But generally what should happen is this should be replaced with uh, an embedded video. So the, something always goes wrong in the live demo and that's what we're on today's live demo. But the idea is that um, we can support Kaltura on embeds. I'm not sure why it didn't work for me right now. Steel, but, um, Neil? Yeah. Yeah, um, just wanted to make one clarification here in case there's anyone else in the audience that is new to Kaltura. Uh, the OEmbed link that you've got right there came from MediaSpace. And MediaSpace is an extension of the Kaltura product. Correct. But not everybody's using MediaSpace. That's so correct. for example, Grand State College uses, is, it uses Kaltura, but we don't use MediaSpace. So therefore, if I were to gather a link of some kind from my LMS, my hook or by crook in one form or another, and pasted it into this environment, it, I, I don't think it would expand itself out into a full-blown iframe player. That, that's correct. So, so that's, Kaltura, Kaltura only supports OEmbed for their media space product at the present. Kaltura may change that in the future and that would help people like Steve and other users. So I guess this is a small niche of you, but if your campus uses Kaltura media space, and you would like to support add support for OEmbeds, please let us know and we can add it to our kind of global allow list and make it so that it's easier for you and other users to embed Kaltura media space videos in your Pressbooks network. Thank you for helping clarify that, Steve. You're exactly right. Um, so we've done it for a few schools and if you're a school that wants that, let us know. Let Amy or I know at Premium Support and we'll get that worked out for you. Um, the other thing that we want to let people know is that we've made a bunch of other improvements that aren't really demoable, but um, we've made a bunch of improvements to our API and how we're communicating metadata in advance of the directory and the book fetcher that we're about, about to demo. So our team's been hard at work on a lot of those things. They're a little bit less exciting for regular end users, but for the computers that talk to each other, they're very helpful. And we've also been working on multilateral SSO. So Rama and Lilia know because we've exchanged dozens of emails. eCampus Ontario is using this. If you are a consortial Pressbook, if you have a, a Pressbooks network that's shared by many schools in a consortia, we have, a be we have better tools and solutions to handle multilateral SSO, which means using your net ID from several different schools to log into the same Pressbooks network. So we spent a lot of time refining and improving that as a solution. If that's something that you need, you can let us know or let Sarah know at sales and we can figure out what you need and how to get it for you. 
Um, and we've also been working to improve our LTI 1.3 provider uh, plugin. That's the results for LMS tool. Some of you are piloting this tool. What it allows you to do is launch your Pressbooks content in your LMS and exchange great information from H5P interactive content in your chapters. Uh, a lot of you have seen it in previous uh, network manager demos and we've just been refining and making improvements based on some pilot users that have been enjoying that experience. So that's what we've been up to. Anybody have questions for me about new, uh, new features or things that you thought I was gonna mention and didn't? I, I have to ask Steele, <laughs> I, you mentioned there's an equation editor in Pressbooks. I, no, that was news not. to me and I just looked and I can't find it anywhere. So there's, there's not an equation editor. What I was, I guess, yeah, so let me clarify. Um, I can show you with a demo of the screen. You're, uh, I'm sorry if that was misleading. Which, which screen did I just share? Is it, are you seeing the a Pressbooks editor right now? Uh, yes. Okay, great. So here I can create an equation with a couple of different methods. The most common method would be to say, let's use a LaTeX short code and we'll say just a simple polynomial, for example. Okay, uh, well, I'm good. Uh, uh, the other way that you can do this, though, is you could make an equation by entering special characters. So this is not exactly uh, an equation builder, but many, like, for example, what Jonathan was asking about Greek characters. Right. Let's say I wanted to use one of these characters in a mathematical sense, like delta. I could have made the equation by just entering the character or if I knew the keyboard command for it. So there's not a there's not an equation builder like you might think of with a dedicated like wire. Tool. Yeah, yeah. How, I was thinking like the wireless or the weirus. Uh... That would be cool. Yeah, we don't we don't have that yet, like a weirus or like an overleaf. But all right, we're thinking about it. But not, I feel not, better now. Okay, <laughs> thanks, Wade. Um, any other questions for things that people wanted clarity on or clarification on before we get to our real exciting part of the demo? Okay. Um, now I want to show you what I think you all came for, which is the Pressbooks directory. So our Pressbooks directory is approaching a first public release. So if you would like to see this and check out some things, you can visit staging.pressbooks.directory and you will see the live version of our beta directory. What we're doing right now is we are pulling in all of the public books from the networks, the Pressbook networks that we host. We would love to include other books from open source networks. We just need to make sure that they're running the latest version of Pressbooks. So they need to be on Pressbooks 5.17.2 or later because that is the version that includes the most recent API and metadata changes that we need for our fetcher tool that goes and updates the metadata. So there's a, a few things that I wanna show you here. Um, one is that we want all of you as network managers to be able to review and look at what's being displayed for books on your networks and have some time to feel like it's the face that you want to prepare to the world. There's two things that we've done recently that I think will be very helpful for you. One is we have set up what we're calling the directory fetcher it's a tool that we run and it's a, a job that goes and looks every hour. We look at all of our Pressbooks networks and we say, has anything been updated? And if there has been an update, we will update those changes man or will automatically every hour on the hour. And I will show you, we'll do a kind of proof of concept, show you how that works with a live example shortly. Homeland's gonna be my uh, assistant behind the curtain. The second thing that we're doing is um, we've also built in the two different ways that you can choose to exclude your book from the directory, even if it's a public book. So first I wanna show um, what you can do is, I have a, a book here, this is my example webinar book. And you'll notice here, this book is public and it's on oar.pressbooks.pub. So I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna look for, what was it called, example, if I can type right, example webinar. And I'll search and, oh good, there's only one book that has this particular title and I'll see. Here's the book that I just searched for. It's on oer.pressbooks.pub. Here's the name of the Pressbooks network. Here's the title of that book and I could link to it and see it in the real world and say, oh cool, this is a public book, I like it. And here's the metadata that's been provided. It has an author. It was last updated today. 
It has a word count. It has storage size. It has a cover image. It's in English. It's all rights reserved. It has 63 H5P activities. That's a nice thing to know. And this is not a cloned book. This is an original. This was built from without being cloned from another Pressbooks book. So here's some of the information that's available about this book. But I might say, you know what, this is a this book's a work in progress. I, I mean, it's, I want it to be public for now, but I don't want it in the directory. So the, the option that you have here to opt out of the directory is <laughs> to come in to your book at the individual book level and click sharing and privacy. In the sharing and privacy settings, you can click Pressbooks directory, no, exclude this book from the Pressbooks directory. This means that the book will still be available on the open web. I haven't made the book private, but I'm telling our fetcher, hey, take this book out of the directory for now. So I've saved that change. Now, when I refresh this page and I'm searching for example webinar, you'll see instantly this book has been removed from the directory. So that's what, if you'd like to take a book from your network out of the Pressbooks book listing, that's the recommended way to do it. You can leave the book public and they can just opt out very simply by going to sharing and privacy settings. At any time, they can change that and say, yep, I'm ready to go back in the Pressbooks directory. And the next time our fetcher runs on the hour, it will be added back in. The remove will be instant. Adding back in will come the next time we run our fetcher. And right now we're running it every hour. We may end up running it more frequently, but for now, for our test network, we're just running it every hour. The other thing that you can do is you can say, okay, so Homan, behind the scenes, I've just changed this back to yes. Will you run the fetcher and bring that book back into the directory? Certainly. Just give me a few seconds. Okay. While Homan's doing that, I'm also going to go into book info and I'm going to say, um, before you remember, there wasn't a lot of metadata about this book. Let's look at the Rebus guide. Here's an example where there's much more useful metadata. And I can see, I can say, you know, my book wasn't very descriptive. I like to have more descriptive information, like an editor, a subject, all that kind of stuff. To make sure that's up to date, you can simply come into your book information here. So I'm going to add a co-author. My friend Naomi worked on this with me. So I'm going to add her as an author. I'm also going to add um, UW Madison was the editor. That's not really true, but we'll say that. The publisher here, we'll call it Steele's Awesome Press. It's one of my favorite presses. Um, and we'll leave this other stuff blank. Let's say the, the language here, I'm going to say it's English United States just for demo purposes. I'm going to add a cover. So I've got a little cover image that I prepared earlier. If I can find it. Okay. So this one's kind of fun. It says we're open. I got it from Unsplash. And then I'm going to give this book a subject. So this is going to be history of architecture, sure. And I'm going to change the copyright license. Naomi and I agreed that this should be CCBY, not all rights reserved. And I'll give this book a description, a really great demo book for a live webinar I'm hosting. Okay. So I've just entered a bunch of new metadata about this book. What we're going to now notice is the next time this fetcher runs, we should expect this up, this information to be updated. First, I'm going to go back and look for the book to see that it was added publicly. So if I search example webinar, I'm sorry, i got to refresh the page. Here's my book. It's back in, right? Homeland ran the fetcher. I told the book to be public. It's here. Now I've entered a bunch of new metadata for the book and saved it. Homan, will you run the Fetcher updater again for me? And we'll see the difference after I've entered some new information here. You want me to update it now? Please do, yes. Watch that. So what we're going to expect to change would be this author field will have new values. We'll have a bunch of new information here. And we'll also see the cover image and the copyright status will be changed for this book. And then, Homan, you can give me the go-ahead when you're ready for me to refresh. It's pretty fast, but it's not instant. You can try it now. OK. So I'm going to do a hard refresh. And we'll now notice that if I look, for example, webinar, now you'll notice all that new metadata that I just entered into the book. It's automatically updated to our directory. So you can see here are the two authors I entered. 
Here's the editor, the subject, the publisher, and my description just made it in. My cover has been changed, my language has been changed, and the, the copyright license has been changed. Now, all of these fields are also values that I can filter and search by over here. So for example, I really like that this book is CCBY, so I wanna find other CCBY books. I can click this and clear out my search term, and I'm gonna see all of the CCBY books on the Pressbooks Network. And I might say, you know, I wanna sort them by word count. So then I could, oops, I did something wrong. I wanna sort them by word count. And so here, all of the books on this network are now sorted by word count. So here's the biggest book of, on any of the Pressbooks networks. Christy might be able to tell you the story about this one. It's a 970,000 page biology behemoth. Or I could say, let's sort by the books that were updated most recently. And you can see the most recently updated book on all of the Pressbooks networks are this example webinar book that you just saw me edit in live time. Here's another book that was just updated recently. Viva just made some changes to this introduction to women and gender studies book. Or I could say, let's just show me the default, show it alphabetical order. And you can change the number of results there. So that's a little bit of a tour for how the, this, the demo staging directory works. What our plan is, is to take a couple of weeks and to give everybody time to look over their book listings. If you'd like to clean them up and update them, you can do that before we go live live. But you should also realize this will be continually updated in close to real time. So if it's not all done by the time the network goes live, it's okay. The point is to just help people discover things and find things better. In my opinion, it's probably better to have an imperfect listing than no listing at all, just in terms of being generous and having stuff out there. A lot of us realize that OER is scrappy and having something is usually better than nothing. So here's Christy saying, oh, embarrassing, we want to remove this one from the directory, so she's probably going to go and hide that book. And now she has the tools to go and do that. <laughs> um, the other thing that I will show you, and I want to caveat this and say, please only use this as the nuclear option. There is a way for a network manager to globally exclude all books except for those that they have put into their catalog. Use this cautiously because it really does damage the general findability of the directory. But if it is relevant for your situation, I'd like to show you how you can do that and what you can do. If you are a network manager, you will see at the network level, if you come into your network admin dashboard, come to settings and network options. You will now see a book directory setting. Use this with caution. This one says, exclude non-cataloged public books from the Pressbooks directory. What that means is, if I were to look at my book list, on this particular network I have, uh, on every, every Pressbooks network, you can have books that are public and you can have books that are in your catalog and they don't have to be the same. So for example, in this particular case, I have lots of public books, but not very many of them are in this network's catalog. I'm gonna change that and put, I don't know, these, these two books are now in my catalog. So if I were to visit the Pressbooks network root page, you'd see there's two books in my catalog now. These other seven books are public, but I haven't explicitly listed them in my catalog. If I want to say, oh, I only want people to find the books that I've, my, I myself have added to the catalog, you can do that, but it will remove author agency, which is why we generally don't encourage you to do it. But in some cases, that's what you want or you need. So if you know what you're doing and you want to do this, you can exclude non-catalog public books from the Pressbooks directory. And I'll give you an example of what will happen when you do this. So I'm going to come down and I'm going to filter by network. Uh, and I'm going to look at Pressbooks OER. OK, so right now Pressbooks OER has five books that are showing up in the directory. Now. After I make this change, it's going to be fewer books because the ones that aren't in the catalog will disappear. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to exclude non-public non books from the catalog. And after that change, I will expect this Pikeville book and my example book to be the only books left in the directory. So I've made that change. Those settings have saved. Now when I refresh this, we will see, oh, Pikeville and Example Webinar Book are the only books left in the directory. 
even if that individual author wanted their book to be listed, tough luck because my network rules are you can only get in the directory if I put you in the catalog. So that's the other option. Um, I'm going to turn that setting back off because you probably don't want to, to have that setting on. But um, And when this setting gets turned off, Homon will have to run the sinker again, but the sinker will go find all of the public books, check to see whether they're individually excluded and put them in or put them out, depending on that setting. I think I explained that correctly. Homan, can you run behind the scenes, run that, that sinker again, and we'll see the number of books go back to five rather than two here. Um, while Homan's doing that, I have a question from Lillian in the chat. It looks like the book sharing and setting privacy settings, it's possible for a user to select private and include in the directory. Um, yes. So Lillian, the, if, if a book is set to private, it will not appear in the directory no matter what. So even if they say, yes, put in directory, if the book itself is not public or it's, it's general privacy status is not public, it won't be included in the directory. If a book is public, the default value will be, yes, I'm in the directory, unless they change it to no exclude from directory. So they only have to worry about the setting if they have a public book that they want to exclude. So that's, we think that it's going to be a smaller percentage of cases, but that's going to be the, the way that they need to make the change. That's 100%, yes. The other thing that you'll want to know is we are also right now on the staging directory we're setting an arbitrary word limit and we're automatically excluding anything under 1500 words. A lot of times you'll make a demo book or a test book or something and it's just got a few chapters in it. We just are, we're gonna say it doesn't qualify as a book until it hits the 1500 word limit. We picked that arbitrarily, we thought it was a good cutoff. Um, we can adjust that down or up, but right now any of your public books without 1500 words, you can just not worry about them. The other thing we're doing is if the book title has the word test or demo, we're excluding those, but we can change and lighten those rules. Those are just some, those are some settings that we've set up for our staging network to help us filter out things so that users didn't have to manually make those changes. So when you go and look, you'll notice that if you have a book that has test or demo in its title or has fewer than 1500 words, it will not show up in our directory, no matter what you do. It'll be treated as a private book. Um, yeah, so thank you, Steve, for reporting that right now. The display, it's going to be, it's its not translating the HTML characters. It's, its um, what's it called, unencoding them. So ampersands will appear as the HTML escaped character rather than the ampersand. We'd like to fix that and, and work on that in the future. Thank you for mentioning it. Keep the bugs coming. We're going to try to get some of these squashed before public release. All right, Holman, how are we doing on the, the syncing? Can you test that again? Okay. All right, so now you can see we've got five books back again. So that setting worked and it was doing what it was expected to do. I wanna pause and say, first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you. Holman has done an incredible amount of work on this. This was not an easy project to build. It had a bunch of complicated pieces. It's the API talking to itself. It's the fetcher. It's got a bunch of updating pieces and Homan's done a lot of great work. Thank you, Homan. It wasn't just Holman, but he was the big lead on this. So thank you. Um, I want to stop and say any questions about the directory or about the things that I just showed with metadata and opting out. Uh, Steele, what would you suggest? Um, we have one of the colleges in our larger institution that is host uh, self-hosting their own Pressbooks instance. Now, I have not been privy to it. I don't know what's behind the curtain, but would you recommend that they contact their Pressbook representative about uh, coming to sort of a handshake that makes this work? Or what, what would you suggest that, that a awesome. so, organization do who rolls their own? So we would love, this is great. So we would love, we would love, love, love to include self-hosted Pressbooks networks. Like, for example, BC Campus is a big one. They've got a huge library and some great content. The, the most important thing that we need to do is we need to work with whoever is hosting their network to make sure that they have Pressbooks updated to a 
a recent enough version that we can get the metadata that we need because we made some changes to our API so that this would work. As soon as we confirm with the open source network that it's running on a recent enough version of Pressbooks, it's very easy for us to add them to our fetcher list. So we, we did a proof of concept with several open source networks. Some of them were updated and some of them hadn't been updated in a long time. So if you are aware of an open source network that you'd like to be included, please put us in contact with whoever is hosting it or running it. And we'll try to work with them to help it get up to date. Obviously, we can't provide 100% assurances that they're running the latest version of Pressbooks because we don't host for them. But we're, we are in contact with some of the larger open source users and we're going to let them know that we'd like to include their books and please update to this version. And if you have others in mind, please do the same. Well, what did you say about BC Campus? What's on their horizon? Because they're a big one. Yeah, I don't. I, the last I heard, they were planning to update in October, but I that's right now. So I will check in with them and find out what, what version they're at. We haven't really pushed and announced this yet because the change that the last change that we needed for all this to work was just released this week. So you're seeing it like this was the first demo we've ever done because it's just been released. So now we're at a point where we can tell open source users, this is the version you need. It's stable. Please do it. So um, I'm great to see all the excitement and thanks everybody for staying. I'm sorry that we didn't leave as much time for the community roundtable as we normally would. Um, I am willing to stay and listen to anything you'd like to share, but I recognize your time. And if you need to go, please do. But if you'd like to share anything with the larger, larger community, you can let me know now. I can put it in our notes and I can share it in, a, in our forum later too. I'm going to stop the recording. Um, thank you for joining us and really appreciate your time and attention.